Dear all, on behalf of Women Act, I would like to welcome you to our panel, which focuses on inclusive leadership in tech and innovation. My name is Maria Gianniu. I am an empowerment and leadership coach and corporate trainer and co-founder of Women Act, an NGO which empowers women in leadership positions. As such, the issue of inclusive leadership is central both to my professional and personal endeavors. Today, I am very pleased to host a remarkable group of women, all leaders in their respective fields, and I am certain that we will have a very fruitful discussion. So let me briefly introduce our speakers. Merrilli Mexi, consultant at the International Labor Organization and head of the Platform Economy Initiative uh, at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. Mariana Skilakaki, editor-in-chief at Athenea. Sarita Varou, Head of Uber Greece, and Konstantina Psaraku, Director Marketing and Digital at uh, Papastratos Greece. So uh, since we only have half an hour at our disposal, I have prepared a set of questions which will guide our discussion. So I suggest we take turns at answering them, and I would kindly ask you to be brief in your answer, let's say two minutes each, okay? So let's go. So uh, corporate culture plays a crucial role in the reproduction or not of gender biases within the working environment. How can companies create and promote cultures that respect diversity and inclusion and support women in leadership positions? Uh, Sarita, could you please um, start? Yes, uh, thank you, Maria. So. Uh, we as uh, Uber have been on a well-documented uh, journey, I would say, to become a more uh, diverse uh, and truly inclusive company. Uh, we started in 2017 uh, by changing our, uh, you know, inviting these diverse perspectives essentially to the decision-making table and establishing a more inclusive and diverse uh, policies, processes and norms in our culture. And in 2020, this expanded further uh, because we wanted to make sure that in this, you know, uh, very difficult year, uh, we made sure that all of our employees uh, felt like they, they belonged. So we, we have launched, you know, uh, several sets of uh, initiatives. Uh, and I wanted to start with the Culture Forward, which is a learning uh, experience, one of our premier learning experiences to help employees at all levels uh, in understanding uh, how they can build self-awareness around these issues and how they can, they themselves can promote essentially a, a more inclusive behavior in, uh, in, in, in the company. Uh, we have also expanded uh, our uh, and refined our sponsorship program. Uh, and this program is a program that I have been a part of and has been very helpful in my um, development within Uber. Uh, and essentially focuses on providing more visibility and upward mobility to underrepresented groups uh, and women at more senior levels. So essentially it gives uh, women access to, to things that they couldn't have uh, otherwise. Uh, another very important step that we've taken towards this uh, direction has been the leadership accountability in DNI, uh, in DNI KPIs. So essentially, Many of our very senior leaders have a specific KPI in their performance uh, review, which is called Progress on Measurable Day, uh, DNI Targets. And they are tracked against very specific goals and their uh, compensation is also you know, dependent on how they do on this specific uh, KPI. And we have evidence that this has actually contributed in a very positive way on um, uh, on representation and things that uh, are quite important on, on that field. Uh, and I wanted to close, uh, you know, my, my remark on this with, uh, with the employee resource groups that we have at Uber. And Women at Uber is essentially one of the most, uh, uh, you know, important and most active and supported groups. Uh, and it, it hasn't been in the beginning. So within these last uh, three years, I have seen many senior leaders taking a very active role uh, in that group on how we can promote more women within, uh, within the company and how we can promote advancement of women within Uber. And I have seen many uh, male employees that are very active allies on that. 
uh, which has, uh, it makes me very proud to be part of, of, of this company in that sense. Thank you so much, Sarita. That sounds very of interesting, course. concrete policies and steps that transform uh, an, an inclusive culture in your uh, company. Uh, Konstantin, I will turn to you now. How about Papastratos? Sure. Uh, let me start by sharing how honored I feel to be part of this panel today among very successful female leaders and exchange opinions on such an important topic. So, corporate policies can definitely help by providing a common set of rules, especially for big multinational companies. However, what matters most is the actual commitment of a company's leaders to demonstrate respect for diversity. But let me give you some concrete examples of how we're approaching this in Papastratus. First, we have an official target on the percentage of females in managerial roles. To achieve this, we know we need to be bold, so it is not enough to aim for a 50-50% on the new hires. This is why we become intentionally skewed to female profiles. We even recently shared a job posting for engineers to join our operations function, asking specifically only for female candidates. Second, when it comes to compensation, we are committed to equal pay for equal work between men and women. As a proof of that, we are proud to be part of Philip Morris International, the first organization ever to be globally equal salary certified. Third, when it comes to promotions, we are actively offering equal opportunities, irrespective of the gender. Myself, I'm a proof of it. I got my promotion right after my second maternity leave. So our aspiration is for Papastratos to lead the way for matters of diversity and inclusion. Equality for us is not just one more corporate objective. It is a commitment to the society. Thank you so much, Constantin. And we need this kind of models in the corporate environment in Greece. Uh, let me turn to Mary Lee. Uh, what do you think about uh, corporate culture and its relation to diversity and inclusion? Thank you, Maria. Well, uh, I do present a specific company uh, uh, on this panel, but I have been working a lot with policymakers and employer organizations in an effort to prepare women for the digital uh, age. Uh, this is the important how can actually we achieve women's empowerment in the digital age? So I'd like to give you some, some data in relation to that. So uh, what I, we know that rich countries and governments, our government, our country, Greece, have embraced the digital tradition uh, transition goal. And we're working to, to leverage the technology to investments. Now, now, we have recent studies showing that the transition to the digital economy is not going to be very easy for women. It's, it's going to be actually a very difficult part, path. Uh, what are the problems? Well, uh, new jobs in the digital economy will require strong ICT skills and education that many female workers do not have. So what does this mean? Very simply that uh, women will be left behind. They will lose their jobs. And we also have data showing that women are at high risk of displacement from automation in several sectors and occupations. So this means that they will be replaced by machines or robots. So we have ILO reports showing that uh, in several regions in, in, in Asia, for instance, and in several accounts, Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand, women are about twice as likely to be in an occupation that is at high risk of displacement as their male counterparts. And we have similar data for several countries in Greece. So all of this data, global data, suggests um, a rather dark future for women. So what should be done? For sure, we need to develop new programs, both public and uh, private sector, corporate programs, who should aim actually to empower women in the digital economy. And, and we need to develop design programs that should aim to eliminate biases and stereotypes that actually affect women's access to both IT and STEM education and career. And we need, especially inside companies, to promote new roles and mentors who could actually inspire and support women's digital and leadership. And the most important thing, I think, is actually that women, that companies need to invest in women's continuous upgrading skills education. We know that the digital economy demands advanced technical abilities that require 
couldn't upgrade those skills. So it's very important that companies build uh, women's skills on a very systematic uh, basis. For me, uh, these are the key pillars for actually uh, creating or building a generation of female leaders, a new generation of digital uh, change makers. Thank you, Marilee. You touched upon a very specific and thorny issue. So I will turn to Mariana now. Uh, Mariana, you work in Athena with uh, many companies. How do you see, you know, culture, uh, corporate culture, uh, respecting or not diversity and inclusion? So thank you. First of all, thank you for including me in this panel. It's really an honor to be a part of it. Um, I'd like to give more of a generalist answer. I, 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 you know, we've heard some great policies, some great best practices, the importance of target setting. Um, I, I think everything plays a role in this uh, in this perpetual cycle of gender biases and in breaking that cycle. Uh, I think the tricky part is realizing just how many of these biases are always operating in the background without us necessarily realizing it. And there is this cultural shift that needs to happen for us to see real change. Uh, now, let me give you an example. Uh, going back to the start of my uh, professional career as an investment banking analyst back then in a US firm, I can tell you for a fact that I wasn't thinking about these issues very actively. The firm I worked for was great at hiring in a representative way. My class of analysts uh, was filled with uh, bright, ambitious young women. But as I looked up uh, uh, the hierarchy, there were fewer and fewer of those in positions of authority. And yet, you know, I was doing well. I was lucky enough to be a part of a great team of men. Um, I didn't at the time see any of these limits that we have uh, been talking about. So it was difficult for me to fully realize just how many gender biases were still at play, even in my work environment, because obviously the lack of women at the top was not incidental. So there is this trap of not seeing because of a certain privilege, perhaps, or even luck, or because theme, things seem to be going our way. So I think that to create a culture that truly, truly respects diversity, we have to encourage, actively encourage people to become better at imagining themselves in some, someone else's shoes. And, you know, just because something is not happening to you right this minute, it doesn't mean it isn't happening and you shouldn't be aware of it or mindful of it. And I think that's a big realization that needs to be encouraged. And sometimes it might even be undermined by some of these more positive, empowering uh, messages that we see um, uh, about, you know, you can do it, it's up to you. If you try, you will succeed, which are all the rage these days. And I think, you know, gender inequality is not the result of a lack of effort on, on anyone's part, but rather, you know, systemic factors that are incredibly difficult to overcome when you look at society as a whole. And companies have a responsibility uh, to step in uh, just as the state does, to correct these systemic inequalities. Thank you, Mariana. You touched upon uh, stereotyping and, you know, um, unconscious biases, which are really important. So we'll go to my second question. Um, the working environment has been created by men, of course, and is still at large based on the needs of men. I would say that the prototype of the successful worker is the character of Don Draper of the TV series Mad Men. He's a firm leader, decisive, he's always available, he works late hours, he has the time to get a drink with the boys after work. So this is a kind of prototype that doesn't seem to match the needs of women. How then can we create a future of work that actually works for women? Merrily, would you like to go first on that one? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, very interesting question. And I do agree that prototypes and role models are a key in gender diversity and in building gender uh, gender inclusion, actually. Um, I think to be able to create a future world for women, we need to see our baseline. And our baseline uh, doesn't look very good. Um, we have a considerable gap in the workplace. And let me give you some data. Um, uh, according to very recent World Economic Forum data, work workplace quality is not expected to be reversed for another 267 years. So you can see the situation. Um, now, what should be done? Uh, legal changes, quotas, for instance, quotas are important uh, in my view, but not sufficient. Quotas may add women to, to corporate but they do not disrupt uh, uh, press and gender binaries that actually perpetuate uh, power inequalities within corporations and organizations. So, so I think uh, 
is a company should focus more or uh, more on cultural organization changes, as your question is implying. So um, if we want to, to companies to create more inclusive workplaces, uh, three elements, three um, are important in my view. First, I think it's very important for companies to track, measure, and hold managers accountable for diversity and inclusion. And I think if this metric is not tracked, um, in my view, we may never see uh, any actual improvement. So I think it's very crucial. And second, I think that companies should actually include more opportunities for better work-life balance, especially now that hybrid work is growing globally. And the third element I would like to bring to our discussion is the fact, and that actually is quite quintessential, um, companies should stop paying once and for all. So for me, uh, these are the three important elements uh, if we want to build a future work that actually works for everyone and especially for women. Thank you, Marily. Thank you, Marily. I would go now to Costadina. Costadina, what do you think? How can companies, you know, create this future work that works for women? Okay, first of all, this is for sure a man's world, as the song would say. To a large extent, this is still valid. Women are no longer excluded from this world, but this time we are called to adapt so as to fit in it. So here comes the question of choice and sacrifice, to be a mother or to make a career, make a family, or chase a promotion. Whatever answer you give, you will be wrong because the question itself is wrong. I believe you can combine everything, be everything, as long as the environment in which you work and grow in gives you the opportunities. Papastratos respects and mainly gives time and motivation to be able to enjoy your personal choices. An example for this is maternity leave. The mother receives an additional three weeks of full-time maternity leave, so eight weeks before and 12 after the birth of her child. Respectively, also the father receives four weeks of fully paid paternity leave, and this is almost one month of extra help to new mothers. So, is this enough to make the decision to have a child? By itself, not. But it is for sure a sign of corporate culture that rejoices and strengthens all these different roles we have as women. Now, looking forward, I really believe the remote working scheme that became our new reality due to COVID will be an accelerator for a future of work that works for women. Women will get many more opportunities to thrive in the work environment and be able to evaluate their options based on their preferences and not family obligations. Thank you so much, Constantina. I will turn to Mariana now. What do you think that this kind of future of work for women should look like? Uh, first of all, I have to say I love uh, this question because I think designing a future of work that works for women is a key to solving a lot of these issues that we have been talking about. Uh, now, we all know that at least in some professions, a lot of bonding goes on after hours. Uh, you will get a drink, you will play tennis with a coworker, you will go to this event where a lot of people from your industry are going to be, you will get to speak at a conference such as uh, this one. So in theory, as, 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 as we already said, no one is stopping women for, from participating in a lot of these activities these days. In practice, though, a lot of these hardworking, successful women in their 30s and 40s and 50s have kids at home. So the timing of these after hours activities is literally all the time they have with their kids. Now, you will probably think men have kids, too, but the expectation certainly doesn't seem to be the same. And that perhaps needs to change. But the result uh, for women is they often miss out on all of the socializing. Uh, they miss out, maybe I should say we miss out on some of the networking and they often miss out, we often miss out on very real opportunities. So the question here is how can we fix that? I think the first step is understanding that it's not about choice. It's not necessarily about choice, but it's about circumstances and making those circumstances better. And, and I'm so happy and optimistic to hear that a lot of the companies um, and two of the companies that we uh, that we are hearing more about today are doing things to make the circumstances better. Uh, it's also about scheduling events at more suitable time slots, making an extra effort to invite and include women uh, in all of these uh, events, providing more flexible work hours, and of course, as a state, uh, providing more options for childcare, which I think is 
uh, probably the single most important issue to really, really expand choice and, and make the circumstances better uh, for, for everyone at the end of the day. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, Sarita, does Uber uh, actually create those circumstances to which Mariana referred to for helping a, a future of work that works for women? We do. And uh, I wanted to focus, though, uh, this answer to a different, uh, to, to take a different take on this on this item. Yes, we do similar uh, to other companies, parental leave for, for everyone, uh, and it's four months paid uh, for everyone. And, and we do have uh, a flexibility program. But what I wanted to focus on uh, is more on how these prototypes do not work. And uh, essentially, there is this perception that is, is not only, you know, the visual image in terms of demographics, but also the set of uh, behavioral traits that a leadership ideal engages in. And I think, you know, that leaders can play a massive role in changing this. So first comes awareness. Uh, become aware as a leader, but also create awareness within the company. And in order to do that, uh, you know, we need to, to actually disrupt that denial that everybody has the same experience in the organizations. Uh, you know, there are policies and everything, but not everybody experiences an organization the same way. So we need uh, to understand that as, as leaders and also understand the privilege that comes with uh, holding a leadership position and decide how to spend this, uh, this privilege. And I've, uh, I've shown uh, a, sen a very senior leader in our organization that actually took a took a stand, you know, in uh, women for leadership. Ed educated himself on inequality issues and actually made a significant, you know, impact on how uh, Uber's culture changed. Uh, and how did he do that? He educated himself first, but then he opened an, a dialogue, listening sessions with, uh, you know, different uh, groups of employees and shared his learning journey with with their tips. And I saw that more and more people actually engaged in, in these conversations uh, after this, this journey. But, you know, the work does not stop there. That's when actually it starts because after, you know, a company or becomes aware, then uh, work needs to be done. So, uh, you know, similarly to other issues, uh, inequality is a, is a business problem and it, it needs to be treated as such. So it needs, you know, working groups and generate plans and measure these plans and the effectiveness of this plan and then it makes a lot of you know a lot of impact to to make sure that every little bit counts so you know even in the most trivial conversations in you know in the uh, coffee break room or in an off-site uh, we need to take action in every uh, small moment that might seem irrelevant at the moment but it helps in cultivating this this culture and going back to behavioral traits, I wanted to, to share one thing that, you know, has been, uh, has impacted me a lot over the last year. And this was uh, Jacinda Arden. Uh, and, you know, uh, this woman is a head of state and she openly showed actually that kindness and compassion along with determination are actually compatible, but uh, are, are actually com compatible and a phenomenal combination because through compassion and kindness, you get the buy-in and trust from people, and then you that and then you need the determination for a solid execution of what. Of Thank what you so much. Sorry. You're so right. Um, we have talked about uh, corporate um, culture and policies, but now we'd we'll like to turn. Uh, we only have like six or seven minutes left to turn to media. Um, so first, Mariana, how can media actively contribute to the promotion of an inclusive leadership model? So I'll try to be brief. There's a lot to say on this topic. And, 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 and you know, uh, I think a lot of us will cover, will cover some of these elements. The key thing for me, because in Greece, we've been going through uh, quite a transition over the past few months with the Greek Me Too movement uh, becoming mainstream. Uh, I think um, a concern that I've been hearing a lot about is, uh, you know, this danger of, uh, of the media going too far or of overdoing it. Uh, of vilifying harmless behaviors, of hammering good people for not being aware enough. Now, you know, I've heard these concerns from people that I value as well, uh, but I don't think that is the biggest danger here. 
the media, but also society at large, have been ignoring these issues for a very, very long time. So to me, the real and present danger is us going back to not particularly caring about these issues. Uh, and I think in, in, in making sure that we, that we achieve that, uh, that we achieve some, uh, uh, this, 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 this sense of ownership going forward for, 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 this, for society as a whole to achieve gender equality. We need to, to find allies. We need to make people realize they have a stake in this. We need to help, uh, help people uh, look in the mirror, see whether there are you know, uh, parts of their behavior that they need to change. So I think the media narrative needs to, to start to shift uh, more towards, you know, uh, Le fewer caricatures, less black and white uh, and narratives, uh, trying to show that even those of us who, who care about these issues very deeply are still in a learning process. Um, there's room for everyone. We, we can all be a part of the solution to these issues and not just a part of the problem. But paradoxically, we have to realize that we might be a small part of the problem in order to get there, in order to, to feel like we can be a part of the solution. And that's the narrative that I hope we can see the media propagate more. Thank you so much, Mariana. Uh, Marilee, what do you think? Well, I would like to bring to our discussion a kind of defective, actually. I would like to reverse a little bit the question, because for me, it's important to see how we can actually use media to promote gender equality and gender inclusion. The issue of usage is very important. And I think, you know, talking from the perspective of policy, I, I think it's very important we can build partnerships between public and private sector organizations and see how, how we can use media as a powerful tool to advocate for an inclusive leadership model, one of which is actually uh, based on positive role models for women and girls. But, when, you know, uh, we have many, many problems and many issues to tackle because nowadays, globally, there are so many regressive developments. So I see, we see globally media is being used um, as a tool to promote norms actually to, to patriarchy and toxic masculinity. In many countries, especially social media, are being used to exercise cyber violence against women and against girls. So just to give you some uh, World Health Organization data, um, uh, currently one in 10 we have already experienced the forced cyber violence since the age of 15. This is a very important uh, phenomena and we cannot turn a blind eye on phenomena. So in my view, when thinking about the role of media, we need to think about how we can make the digital public space of social media a safer space for women and girls, a more empowering place for everyone, especially for women and girls, and actually a place more inclusive where both uh, men and women can enjoy equal rights, equal voice, and equal visibility. Thank you so much, Marily. Um, uh, Sarita and Constantina, um, one minute each. How do you think like the corporate environment can relate to the media? Sarita, you go first. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I mean, both uh, Marianne and Marily uh, made some excellent points. I just wanted to, to highlight the following, and it's, some, it's, it's a very practical thing to do. Uh, and it has to do with events and, uh, you know, uh, conferences. So. I know that you're, it's very close to your heart, Maria, but uh, no more manels uh, is, uh, is a very important thing. I remember a few years back, I was at a very prestigious conference and I counted only five women speaker in a full day agenda. And I think that we are, you know, we are evolving from that, but there is still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Sarita. Touche. Costadina. <laughs> So I believe that leaders are not made of steel, but when you present them as such, you automatically place a functional bar which discourages female who cannot pass over it. So I really believe we need to shift the focus from the surface to the essence of being a leader, to highlight the real characteristics of successful corporate leadership. We do not need to build these standards. Today, there are multinational companies that follow extremely successful inclusive leadership models. It is enough for media to highlight them and to release the huge dynamics that hide inside them. And you know what? I believe the world needs female leaders because they bring in the game 
competencies that you won't find easily in males. Empathy, great communication skills, high potential in leading transformation, and of course, stamina. At the end of the day, we, as females, never stop transforming ourselves from one role to the other. So we just need to give women a seat at the table. Thank you so much, Kostadina. This is a very optimistic message and a very real one. Ladies, I would like to thank you for being here, for expressing your views on behalf of Women Act. I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you, Maria. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.